Anyhow, this is a Dunkin' Donuts in Bucksport, which is a, a town near uh, Deer Isle. And I'll just give you the setup is I actually stop there from time to time if I need to stay awake. And I got a donut and I took a bite out of it and there was an earring back baked into it. <laughs> Probably because they knew I was director of a craft school, you know. It was a, maybe it was a conceptual piece, who knows. It was a grad student who'd stopped on the way to Haystack and just got a job at Dunkin' Donuts. Anyhow, that's, that, that, that figures in the poem, just so you know it's coming, as I didn't when I bit into it. Rocky Coast. First, there was the pink granite molten and buried for 350 million years. Then there was the ice encountering the ledge, dragging rocks and trees over the land. And then the lichen working in the cold, ceaseless wind, cleaving to the stone, resurrecting the soil by eating away at the mica and quartz to make a thin layer of earth that the earth rests on. And then there was the Dunkin' Donuts, built on the ledge in 1989 in Bucksport, Maine, the town where the paper mill makes clouds and sends them billowing out into the landscape, the Dunkin' Donuts where the coffee is always fresh and when you inhale its aroma, it's as if you are starting the day again or starting your life over. One more chance. This is where I buy my chocolate sugar donut and drive down Route 15 in the dark when I bite down on an earring back baked into it. I dream of the million dollar liability settlement. <laughs> And that, enough to do whatever I would want to and return to show with horror the small steel post to the young woman in bright polyester at the counter who offers me a dozen free donuts. <laughs> Not enough to change my life, but enough to feed me for a while. And what else could you need? Sugar, fat, and the first bite like Eve's just before she walked out into the fallen world. Yeah. Part, but halfway during my tenure at Haystack was 2001, and my brother was killed in the World Trade Center. And uh, it's really had an impact, I'd say, on everything I've written since then. But it's also one of those moments when you realize, well, not at the moment it happens, but, but a little while later that, you know, you're not the only person who's ever lost anything. Not only that, the entire world is full of loss, and we're making more loss every day. And I just began to think a lot about uh, a sense of loss and what it means. And also, I think, this idea of grief um, and how what really struck me right after it happened was, uh, um, well, first, the incredible support from people uh, I loved and people who knew me, but also uh, uh, the sense of grief. You really don't control it. You have no control over it at all. You can, and so if you, if you think you're fine, you, go with it, because in a little while later you're not going to be fine and you won't have any control over that either. And so this is a poem about that, that experience called Grief Arrives in Its Own Time. Grief arrives in its own time. It doesn't announce itself or knock on the door of your heart. Suddenly, it's right behind you, looking with great pity at the back of your neck and your shoulders on which it spends days placing a burden and lifting it. Grief arrives in its own sweet time, sweet because it lets you know that you are alive. Time, because what you are holding becomes the only day there is. The sun stops moving. The sky grows utterly quiet and impossibly blue. Behind the blue are the stars we can't see, and beyond the stars, either dark or light, both of which are endless. <laughs>